So uh, this is the title that I always give if I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. Uh, uh, this is my current laboratory, clearly having a good time. Uh, I don't show them when, when, they, when they work, so this is a, a, a very young lab that I have right now, uh, uh, except for uh, uh, Miranda Grace, my lab manager, has been working with me also for a very long time. And this, this character back here uh, is, is uh, uh, the person who's, who, uh, whose data I'm going to present uh, uh, today. So again, much of this you all know, so this goes under the boring category, uh, 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 so you can, you can check that box. Uh, human papillomaviruses, as you know, are very small DNA viruses with uh, genomes of about 8,000 base pairs in size, uh, double-stranded DNA genome, only one strand is being, uh, it has, has coding co uh, uh, potential and encodes something like uh, six or eight, six to eight uh, uh, early open reading frames, uh, so non-structural proteins and two structural proteins, including L2, which I was told was the most hardest protein to work with uh, this morning. So uh, uh, L1 being the major and L2 being the minor capsid protein. So what is important about these viruses is they're extraordinarily species specific, which is one of the reasons why uh, uh, we are, uh, people who work with, with the papillomaviruses we are not virologists because we can't take HPV and infect mice or, or some, uh, some animal with it. We really have to uh, in, infect human cells uh, uh, with it, not humans, uh, uh, we hope. So papillomaviruses, there's a lot of human papillomaviruses. Uh, I counted them before I came here. There's 469 now in the, in the database that Alison McBride maintains at the NIH, uh, fully sequenced HPVs. And about, of these, about 400 infect cutaneous epithelia, so your skin. So if I would go around the room and sample, uh, sample our skin with a little, little piece of scotch tape or something like that, we would all uh, carry many, many of these, of these viruses uh, uh, without them causing any, any kind of uh, harm. About 70 papillomaviruses infect the mucosal epithelia, so the, not, uh, the, the less keratinized epithelia, the mucosa of the oral cavity and also of the anal genital tract. And these, have, these are the viruses that have been studied in greatest detail because clinically you can, you can basically classify them as either low risk, and these are viruses that cause benign warts. Uh, these, these warts can become really large and, and, and uh, uh, unpleasant, uh, but they will not progress to tumors. They will not uh, kill you. Uh, uh, they will not uh, be, uh, basically be invasive and, and uh, uh, they can be removed. The high-risk papillomaviruses cause lesions that can progress uh, uh, to cancers, uh, uh, and, 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 and those obviously are the ones that, that have been studied in greatest detail. So about 5% of all human cancers are actually caused by HPV uh, infections with this uh, uh, a small number of, of high-risk alpha HPVs, and of course uh, we all know that the large, uh, almost all cervical cancers uh, contain uh, uh, these high-risk HPVs, uh, and, but, but a lot of other endogenital tract, uh, uh, endogenital tract cancers are also caused by HPVs. And about 80% of, of all the oropharynx carcinomas are also caused, caused by HPVs. And it's kind of interesting that while uh, uh, cervical cancer cases, at least in countries that have pap smear techniques, uh, have remained constant or, or have even gone down, because of the uh, uh, in innovations in pap smear uh, technology. Uh, uh, anal, in instance of anal cancer, particularly also of oropharynx carcinomas, has, has dramatically increased uh, over, uh, over the last year. So there's prophylactic vaccines uh, for these tumors, but they obviously don't help the people who are already infected. And the cancers arise often decades after the initial infection. So there's a large number of, of, uh, of vaccinated people uh, uh, that, that basically are already infected and, and, and the vaccine uh, in those people will not do anything. So the prophylactic vaccines have had some, uh, some uh, 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 impact on, on, on uh, pre-malignant lesions in countries where they're used very frequently. I don't know about Italy. I think Italy is one of the countries that, where the vaccine is actually used a lot. In the United States, for example, only about 30% of all the uh, people who, who, who can get the vaccine actually will get uh, uh, the full, uh, uh, full vaccination, and especially people who should get the vaccine because they are what's called medically underserved, meaning that they can't go for frequent pap smears, etc. They do not get the vaccine. So in the United States, there has really not, not been a dramatic decrease uh, in, in, in lesions yet. Uh, and, and obviously, there's many countries uh, in, on, on, in the earth, on the earth where these vaccines are way too expensive to be used uh, uh, for the population. 
So despite prophylactic vaccines, there's still more than half a million ca uh, sort of cancer cases every year with about half of them leading to death. So uh, you can calculate that and you'll find that about every two minutes somebody dies of cervical cancer uh, every, uh, somewhere in, on the planet. In the US, uh, and again, I only, I only have US numbers, uh, uh, but in the US we still have about 4,000 deaths, so about every two hours a woman in the United States dies of cervical cancer. So it remains a, a very serious uh, problem. Uh, Cervical, as I already mentioned, cervical cancer rates decline, but anal and, and oral cancers have increased, and oral cancers actually have already exceeded cervical cancer cases uh, in the United States. And these days, 40% uh, of all the HIV-associated cancers uh, now occur in, in males, uh, and, and only about 60% in, in females. So this has dramatically changed over the years uh, with, with the oral cancers that, that are more frequent in males than in females. So cervical carcinogenesis is a multi-step process like many uh, uh, cancers. Uh, you have the normal epithelium, uh, uh, cervical epithelium shown here. It gets infected and, and over uh, about a year, uh, this can uh, undergo, uh, the infection can, can give rise to what is called a low-grade lesion or cervical intraepithelial lesion one. That can then progress to a CIN2, and that's a, a, a more high-grade high lesion. CIN3 are, are high-grade lesions. The CIN2 is about a, a half of the, of the uh, uh, skin looks like basal cells. So these are the basal cells down here. And you can see about half of the skin looks very much like basal cells. In a CIN3, this would be about uh, three quarters of the epithelium would, be, would, would look like basal cells. So these are high grade lesions, and these are uh, uh, always treated, the, the CIN3 lesions. And these can then progress uh, to carcinoma in situ, where you have a further expansion of these undifferentiated cells, and these eventually progress to invasive cancers, where, where, where basically uh, uh, the uh, the transformed cells make it into basal layer and, and, and can, and, and can uh, form metastases. So this, uh, uh, in general, can, can be a, a very sh uh, fast process, so this can be very quick, this can be with, happening within a year, but in the vast majority of all the cases, the progression from a uh, high-grade lesion to invasive cancers can be uh, 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 years, so it's a very slow process. And that's obviously the reason why uh, uh, the pap smear is such an important weapon against, against cervical carcinoma and has had such an enormous impact on cervical cancer uh, uh, rates all over the planet. The major risk factor for HPV, uh, for, for, uh, for HPV carcinogenesis is the fact uh, that, that there is no regression, namely that, so that, that basically uh, uh, there's a persistent infection that doesn't go away over time. Many of these lesions uh, can spontaneously uh, regress uh, but if they don't, uh, you can eventually end up with invasive cervical cancer. So what happens mechanistically uh, during the time is some, sometimes between uh, high-grade premalignant lesion carcinoma in C2, uh, uh, you basically get this regulated expression of the viral genome, uh, meaning that it, 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 it's no longer regulated the same way it is in earlier lesions. And one way this can happen is the virus can integrate, physically integrate into the host genome. The integration is relatively, uh, relatively non-specific with respect to the host genome, so it happen, doesn't happen just in one specific spot in, in the human genome, but it happens all over the genome. There are some hot spots, but uh, 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 none of them, uh, there's no major one. But what is really uh, very frequent is the fact that, uh, that you almost always have expression, uh, have maintenance of the long control region, which is the non-coding region that contains the promoter. Uh, that, that basically drives expression of the viral proteins downstream, and, and you maintain expression of, of early number six and early number seven, uh, these two proteins, and the rest of the genome is oftentimes deleted or, or rearranged or, or a combination of the two. This obviously is a, a terminal event, meaning uh, once the viral genome is integrated, unlike with retroviruses or other viruses that part of their life cycle is integrated into the genome. This is not the case here. Once the virus is integrated, it's dead as a virus. It can never pop back out and, and replicate because in many cases, half of the genome is gone. Uh, but E6 and E7 are always retained and it's no longer uh, regulated the same way as it would be if, if the virus was, uh, 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 virus, viral genome was expressed from a plasmid. And as I already mentioned, there's no evidence for insertional mutagenesis, meaning that the, that the virus consistently uh, 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 causes dysregulation of, of oncogenes or, or uh, extinguishing uh, expression of tumor suppressors, although that 
that has been shown to happen, but it's not a common, uh, it is no common uh, event uh, overall. So uh, what are high-risk E6 and E7 proteins? So uh, high-risk E6 and E7 proteins are these tiny little proteins uh, uh, that look like nothing else uh, uh, other than E6 and E7. If you run them uh, through, uh, through a sequencing sequence databases, you will find nothing uh, that, that even looks remotely similar to, to E6 and E7, the entire protein. So E6 is about 150 amino acids in general, and E7 is even smaller, has about 100 amino acids. They have common, they have common in common, uh, basically zinc binding or metal binding domains uh, uh, that are unusual. Uh, they're, they're unlike uh, standard zinc fingers because they have a very large uh, spacing between the two CXXC cysteine uh, uh, zinc binding uh, domains, and they form the 3D structure of both E6 and E7 has been solved and they form uh, novel types of, of zinc binding uh, structures that haven't been observed previously. They're, as I mentioned, they're consistently expressed in the cancers and they're necessary for tumor maintenance. And this is something that I think is really impressive. And I always mention that to the medical students. Um, so uh, you know that HeLa cells is the first human cell line that was ever made. Uh, it has a completely messed up genotype, uh, uh, a karyotype, if you look at it. And I can give this, I can, any student who comes to my lab can grow HeLa cells because they grow even if you don't feed them, even if you uh, give them the wrong media, they always grow. But the moment you, you basically extinguish expression of E6 and E7, they actually die. So they remain, despite the fact that they have been cultured for very long, they have many, many genetic aberrations, they remain acutely dependent on E6 and E7 expression. And that's been the case for all the sort of cancer cell lines that have been looked at and also in some other models of, of cancer, it's been shown that they're driven by E6 and E7 and the cell lines remain addicted to expression of these. They're very small proteins, as I already mentioned, they're non-enzymatic, so they, have, they don't encode any enzymatic activities, uh, 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 and, and, um, and it's, it's, it really was for a very long time a mystery how they, how they basically function. They're necessary for viral replication, uh, uh, so, uh, the way they function is basically they, they reprogram host cells by binding cellular regulatory proteins. So what these, what these proteins do is they, even though they don't, they're not enzymes themselves, they basically, for example, bind enzymes and then retarget their activities to other substrates or, or uh, basically activate the enzymes or, or retarget them. So the really most simple-minded way of HIV-associated carcinogenesis is shown in this cartoon here. E7 protein, this early number seven protein, binds to a collin based ubiquitin ligase complex and degrade and basically tar retargets this collin uh, 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 complex, the retinoblastoma tumor suppressor protein. The retinoblastoma tumor suppressor protein, amongst many functions, is an important uh, uh, regulator, negative regulator of G1S uh, transition. So it makes sure that the cell can only enter S phase when it is okay, meaning when all the, the uh, nutrients are available to undergo uh, full uh, DNA synthesis. And it does that by binding to a transcription factor called E2F, a family of transcription factors called E2F, and when RB is bound to E2F, this is, a, this is basically a transcriptional repressor, and it represses S phase genes, keeps cells in G1. But E7, in, in normal cells, this is a highly regulated process, uh, uh, but in, in HB7 expressing cells, E7 basically degrades the retinoblastoma tumor suppressor protein, and, and this whole checkpoint, this whole stopping point between gap phase one and, and DNA synthesis is now gone, and the cells can now undergo aberrant proliferation uh, uh, that is no longer regulated. Now, if every time uh, aberrant proliferation happens in our body, we would develop cancers, we'd probably all be dead uh, by cancer uh, at, at this time. And there is many different, uh, uh, basically, innate uh, defense mechanisms. One of the most important and best studied one is the P53 tumor suppressor protein. So P53 becomes activated upon various cellular stresses and will make the cells uh, either undergo cells, cell division, uh, stop cell division or undergo cell death. And if you imagine that if the, if the virus infects a cell, expresses E7, and turns aberrant proliferation, 
and the cell would be able to recognize that and die, uh, that wouldn't be a very good way uh, to do a viral life cycle. So the E6 protein binds to another ubiquitin ligase called E6AP or UBE3A and targets P53 for degradation. So now we have extended proliferation. So cells can basically uh, uh, proliferate for very long periods of time in an unchecked way. But as you know, every cell has, uh, has a, a built-in clock and can only uh, uh, replicate for a certain number of times because the ends of the chromosomes, the so-called telomeres, shorten every time, every time the cell divides. And eventually, if the telomeres are short enough, the cells will stop growing on the go, a process called replicative senescence. And again, uh, because the viruses uh, want to hang out in, in, in replicating cells for very long periods of time, uh, 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 E6 has turned, turns on a, a cell or enzyme called telomerase which keeps uh, telomeres uh, extended and the cells will now be able to grow uh, forever. Uh, so if you put E6 and E7 into any kind of primary normal human cell, it will immortalize them. And, and it's basically through, these, uh, through, these, uh, through this mechanism. But E6 and E7 are, are, are more devious than that and, and, and one of the things that they do is they induce uh, DNA damage. So they don't just keep the cells along for very long, uh, around for very long periods of time for them to randomly uh, uh, basically accumulate DNA damage, but they basically make the, cells, make, make the cells have more DNA damage at every round of cell division. So they really contribute to malignant progression by inducing genomic instability through many different, uh, many different pathways. So this can then eventually uh, read, uh, need, uh, lead to carcinogenesis. So, so this is sort of the, the, the most simple-minded uh, way to talk about this. This obviously is not a, a full, a full uh, uh, you know, there's many other cellular targets that E6 and E7 have. But what basically, uh, the where these so-called oncogenic activities come from is really, is really from, from the role that these viruses have, that these viral proteins have in the cell cycle, and it's two things. It's basically to persistently infect cells at the basal layers, and these cells are continuously uh, proliferating, and then to basically allow cells to uh, replicate, uh, allow cells to, to support replication of the viral genome in cells that normally have no uh, S phase, no DNA synthesis machinery active again. So you can basically explain all of these uh, uh, so called carcinogenic activities of these proteins. By, uh, uh, by basically having, uh, being, being driven by the necessity to, to basically uh, replicate the genome. So as I mentioned, HPV 6 and E7 have many different targets. Uh, we and many labs have basically focused on, on, on these. This is uh, from uh, the infamous Rosenblatt-Rosen paper that I think uh, you used for some, of your, for some of your studies. But many people have done this, and, and you know, basically E6 and E7 bind to many, many different uh, cellular targets, and, and, and we still find new ones, new interesting ones, as I learned, uh, as I learned uh, this morning. But, uh, uh, you know, we have mostly focused basically on protein coding genes and, until this character joined my lab. So this is Surendra Suresh Sharma uh, uh, from Nepal. Uh, so, I, uh, so he basically said, yeah, you know, protein coding genes, I want to study something that, that hasn't been studied yet or has not been studied much. I want to see whether or not uh, 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 HPVs basically affect the expression of non-coding RNAs. And he was particular about this because he didn't want to, uh, uh, he basically chose these because he said, uh, very compelling to me, I said, well, why do we want to do that? And he said, well, but 98% of all the transcribed, uh, 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 transcribed uh, RNA in, 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 in cells is not, is not made into proteins. So you're basically missing 97.3% of the genetic information if you basically focus only on these 2.7% of the protein coding genes. I thought, okay, good enough for me, so let's, uh, uh, let's do that. Uh, he wasn't interested in ribosomal. So many of these, these are not just long non-coding RNAs, but there's, there's now many different uh, uh, families of, of non-coding RNAs. Maybe the best known ones are the microRNAs that we have also studied in the laboratory uh, uh, and, and obviously HPVs really dramatically affect the expression of cell or microRNAs uh, with very interesting consequences. But he really wanted to focus on long non-coding RNAs. So what are long non-coding RNAs? They're, they're at least 200 nucleotides long and have a, a coding capacity of less than 100 amino acids. So the word non-coding RNA is, 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 a, is a misnomer. Some, uh, many, I mean, almost all messenger RNAs can 
potentially encode uh, small peptides. But at least some of these non-coding, most of these non-coding RNAs function not because they have they encode small peptides, but they, but because of the because really of the RNA. And you can you can do experiments uh, to to uh, uh, to convince you that that's the case. The very the basically they can be cytoplasmic or nuclear, so they can have can have activities in the cytoplasm as well as the nucleus. But they're very versatile biologically because they can interact with proteins. Uh, as well as, as nucleic acids, so DNA or RNA, and they can basically be scaffolds of, of protein DNA, uh, uh, DNA uh, 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 complexes. So we, we, we for example, study uh, uh, expression of uh, polychrome repressive complexes uh, for which the specificity factor in mammalian cells is unknown and could very well be a, a long known coding RNA. They can regulate the stability of translation of messenger RNAs. They can also basically sponge up microRNAs. So they can do uh, many different things. And that makes, them, makes their study very complicated because unlike with proteins, you can't predict what they do by, by sequence gazing. So you really have no clue uh, what, what these things are doing. So anyway, so he wanted to know, are non-coding genes actually targeted or expression targeted by HPV6 and D7? Uh, uh, again, the reason why I want to do this is there's lots of these things, about 20,000 that have now been uh, described, and they, some of them at least play important roles in almost all biological processes. This is the infamous uh, hallmarks of, of human cancer, and you can find a link RNA that basically does any of these, any of these uh, hallmarks. So we looked at the expression of, of, of a subfraction of, of uh, annotated long non coding RNAs, meaning long non coding RNAs that are known uh, that, that have names and that, that are known to be expressed and, and have been uh, are part of the uh, uh, part of the annotated uh, uh, human genome, and we found that in in, in uh, epithelial cells in these 67 or normal epithelial cells, about about 8,000 of these things uh, uh, expressed at, at, at reasonable levels, and we found about a thousand of these being upregulated, and and about 400 of them were downregulated, more than twofold, uh, uh, and and with with a reasonable uh, false discovery rate that we would that that we found acceptable. So this was a, this was a, a, a very interesting finding. And as I mentioned, you cannot do uh, much with this. You have to sort of uh, choose. Uh, uh, pick and choose uh, your long non coding RNA that you want to study because you don't know which one uh, is the interesting one. So Surey basically decided that he would focus on well on annotated and well studied or not so well studied, but at least RNA, long non coding RNAs that have been described in the literature of, of doing something. And uh, basically, uh, 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 he did a QRT PCR analysis of select uh, long non coding RNAs that have been linked either to cervical cancer or to any of these many pathways that E677 affects. And this is a small and basically just a qPCR quantitative RT-PCR on these things. And this is just a number of these that he tested. Uh, uh, and, and, and basically, we initially focused, of course, on, on the one that, that, that he found the most overexpressed. And then in the second part of my talk, I will talk to you about the, on the other side of the spectrum, the one that is the most underexpressed uh, in E6 and E7 expressing cells. The first part is all published uh, in, in this paper, so I will go through this uh, uh, reasonably quickly. So why did we study this? Because we had to study it because of its name, right? The name of this, of this thing is called CCEPR, or Cervical Cancer Express PCNA Regulatory Long Long Coding RNA. So it basically tells you what it does, and it's expressed in cervical cancers. It's highly expressed in cervical cancer tissues, and uh, the, the high the expression correlates with large tumor size as well as, as, as poor prognosis. Uh, and it has been reported to, to promote proliferation of cervical cancer cells by stabilizing PCNA uh, uh, RNAs. It's all, uh, uh, that's all been uh, published. So what we basically wanted to know, is this CCEPR expression driven by HPV expression, or is this uh, uh, an event that happens later during malignant progression? So he made uh, HPV, uh, he made primary human foreskin keratinocytes with expression of E6 and or E7. And he found that if he expressed these, co expressed these 6 and these 7 in these cells, he found about a tenfold upregulation of CCEPR compared to control RNAs. He basically showed that this, uh, that this upregulation is very similar to what he saw in cervical cancer cell lines such as CASCI, uh, uh, but also in HV negative uh, cervical cancer cell lines such as C33A. So, so uh, uh, 
So this is about the amount of overexpression that you see in cancer cell lines. When you look at is it E6 or E7 that drives expression of CCPR, it's really mostly the E6 uh, uh, protein. So E6 seems to be the major driver of overexpression of, of CCPR. Of course, one of the best targets of E6 is P53, so we wondered whether or not this was simply an, an effect of E6, uh, of, of E6 getting rid of P53, so we got rid of P53 by a different mechanism, namely by expressing a dominant negative form of P53. This is a, a form of P53 that will bind, to, bind up normal P53 and deposit it in, un, in basically biologically inert structures. And, but as you can see, if you do that, you actually don't get an increase of CCEPR. In fact, you get a further decrease of CCEPR. So E6 basically uh, 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 turns on uh, uh, CCPR to a mechanism that is distinct of P53 in activation. Uh, when you, what happens if you deplete CCPR in certain cancer cell lines? Uh, uh, what happens is, as was reported, you get dramatic decrease in, in proliferation uh, uh, and, and the decrease. Uh, so these are two different SHRNAs that, that were expressed in, in these cell types. Uh, and this is, the, this is basically the, the same thing uh, uh, shown again. So it inhibits basically viability of, of, of these cells. If you deplete uh, CCPR uh, in E6, E7 expressing cells, uh, uh, you see the same thing. So you can also see this in, in non-cancer cells. And uh, it, it really inhibits uh, viability. These are two independent experiments uh, that, that I'm showing you here. If you overexpress it, the opposite happens. The cells grow much faster. Uh, so this, this assay is an assay that just measures uh, metabolic activity. And you can see, you can see they get a huge increase of, of, of uh, uh, if you overexpress it, you overexpress it very dramatically. And you see an increase in metabolic activity or proliferation of, of these cells. So, so far, so good. Uh, this is what you would predict based on the paper that was published. But when we basically started to look at PCNA expression, we made, uh, if this was really, uh, if, if really it was E6, that, that would drive, uh, uh, if PCNA expression in HPV E6, E7 expressing cells was driven by, by, uh, uh, by CCPR, you would expect to see it very high in E6 expressing cells and in E6, E7 expressing cells. But as we all know, uh, PCNA expression is driven by E7 and certain not by E6. So there's no correlation of, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, CCEPR expression and PCNA expression in these cells. So we basically believe that, that what they published is correct, but it has nothing to do with PCNA uh, expression. So what we showed is that, uh, that CCEPR is elevated in cervical cancer tissues and, cerv and cervical cell lines. This is consistent with what has been published. It's elevated also in E6, E7 expressing HFK. So it's a direct effect of a viral oncogene expression. The expression is driven by E6, and it's not dependent on P53 in activation. And the levels of PCNA do not correlate with P the, the levels of CCEPR do not correlate with PCNA uh, messenger RNA. Depletion inhibits viability of, of, of E6 expression. Uh, expressing cells uh, and overexpression enhances it as, as, you, as you would predict. So this was sort of our uh, uh, start uh, with this. What we're doing right now is always try to figure out what does this, uh, what does this RNA really do? Uh, and this is a very complicated type of experiment where you have to try to do uh, precipitations of this, of this uh, RNA and then do both uh, uh, RNA, uh, basically do uh, RNA and DNA seq uh, uh, of, of associated nucleic acids, but also do mass spec of associated proteins. And it's, 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 it's a frustrating uh, exercise. Uh, and we haven't found anything that we are convinced by as a real target uh, of this. But we haven't given up on it. But he has given up on it because he has to graduate at some point of time. Uh, uh, he hasn't graduated yet. Uh, so he decided to actually focus on, on, uh, uh, on also the, uh, this, this long non coding RNA at the other end of the spectrum that was, uh, that was expressed at much decreased levels in E6, E7 expressing cells compared to normal cells. So what is this cell? It has a cool little name called DINO uh, for damage-induced long non coding RNA. It's a very small uh, uh, long non coding RNA, about, only about 1,000 base pairs. And it was discovered by a well-known uh, group by, uh, by, by Chang, who is a pioneer of, of long non-coding RNAs, and Laura Tardy, who is a well-known P53 person. So we were uh, thinking that this was a good 
good one to look at uh, 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 because uh, it's, it's involved in DNA damage, which, which I think I told you E6 and E7 induce uh, DNA damage, and, and it's, it's, it's basically linked uh, to P53. So basically the name comes from DNA damage uh, induced P53, uh, uh, long known coding it was induced according to their paper by DNA damage through P53. So DNA damage activates P53, P53 then turns on DNA expression, so it's a P53 responsive gene, and then it basically binds uh, to P53 and stabilizes it. So this is the, this is the mechanism that they published uh, in, in, in their paper. So this, is a really, this was very interesting because uh, it is a sort of a counterpart of, 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 of a well-known uh, oncogene called MDM2, which is also a P53 uh, responsive gene that is turned on by P53 when, when, and then switches off the P53 uh, uh, signal uh, uh, on demand, right? So, so what this sort of adds is that uh, what, what this discovery that was published in Nature Genetics basically, uh, basically added to the story is that Dino you know, is sort of the counter apps to the MDM2 signal and really balances P53 levels uh, uh, very closely. So, uh, so we were uh, quite interested in this and we wanted to basically uh, know whether or not uh, whether or not this, uh, uh, this uh, whether or not Dino expression would would would, would basically uh, uh, track with P53 expression in 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 in, in cervical cancer cells, but also in human foreskin keratinocytes. So this is P53 in in normal keratinocytes. It's a nice signal that you see. If you express C6, the signal goes away. You have no more P53. You can detect. You also have no more Dino, or Dino goes down very dramatically. If you express C7, you consistently see, uh, see a stabilization of, of P53 uh, uh, in, in E7 expressing cells. And as you can see here, Dino levels uh, uh, go up quite high. In E6, E7 expressing cells, uh, uh, P53 levels are low, and, and, and so are Dino levels. If you express dominant negative P53, you get a huge increase of P53, but as I mentioned, this is basically biologically inert P53, and, and consistent with this not being transcriptionally active, it can't induce Dino. So, so in, in cervical carcinoma cells and also in HFKs, uh, uh, keratinocytes expressing viral oncoproteins, Dino levels and, and P53 levels really track uh, and correlate with each other. So we, want, we were sort of interested in, in, this, in this concept of, of uh, P53 uh, stability because uh, many years ago we actually published that E7 stabilizes P53 and we were trying very hard to figure out how does this actually function. And it, 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 it basically is, is unknown uh, how it works. It doesn't work through any of the known pathways uh, uh, and, and we were wondering whether Dino was involved in this. So the first thing that we did is we wanted to know whether or not uh, uh, Dino levels in, in E7 expressing cells were actually driven by P53 or through some other pathway. So we knocked down P53 in both basic control and E7 expressing uh, keratinocytes and you can see if you basically do that, uh, Dino levels go down uh, as you would expect and this is the basic expression of a, P, of a P50, other P53 responsive gene called P21. Uh, the levels also go down. So basically what this shows that in E7 expressing cells, uh, 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 Dino, Dino levels, the high Dino levels are really driven uh, through P53. But it's the opposite also true. What happens if you get rid of Dino? Uh, what happens to P53 levels? And as you can see, when we do that, uh, uh, Dino levels go down very dramatically. Uh, this, is, this is basically Dino RNA levels. Uh, and, and also P53 levels go down, and the downstream gene P21 also goes down. So this basically shows that, at least in part, E7 stabilizes uh, uh, P53 uh, through Dino. So how can that be? How can you have both uh, uh, E7, uh, basically uh, E7 levels stabilizing, you know, inducing, inducing P53 and then inducing Dino, and then also Dino uh, uh, basically uh, uh, Dino levels also being being important for uh, uh, basically for E7 E7 stabilization of P53. Uh, well, uh, we'll come back to that because certainly not by this mechanism because this mechanism would argue that e, that that basically E7 induces DNA damage, which you know, which then induces P53 and then induces Dino, which then can stabilize P53. But it doesn't really show uh, how E7 directly uh, stabilizes. Uh, uh, 
how, how E7 directly stabilizes P53. So before we do that, uh, uh, let's switch gears for, for a while and uh, uh, let's talk about Dino expression cervical carcinoma cell lines. As I mentioned, uh, uh, they express low levels of, 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 of Dino. This is a log scale here. That's why it doesn't look very impressive. The levels of, uh, of Dino in CASCI, C or HeLa cells, and also C33 cells, which have a P53 mutation, are very low. They're very, but they're similarly low as E6, E7 expressing HFK. So, that, so we know that these uh, keratinocytes are a good model for cervical carcinoma cell lines. So one of the one of the interesting things in and that we've been trying to do this for for a very long period of time is the fact that unlike many uh, cancer cell lines or cancers, uh, p53 is maintained uh, as a wild type protein in 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 uh, in, in the cervical carcinoma cell lines, but it's it's basically inactive because it's degraded by E6 and E6AP. But fundamentally, it is it is basically there in in, in a wild type form. So one dream of many, uh, of many uh, papillomavirus researchers is to somehow find a way to reconstitute this dormant p53 tumor suppressor activity in cervical carcinoma cell lines. That may, maybe cervical cancer cell lines will die when you uh, re-express or reactivate this dormant p53. So the first idea, basically, we want to know what happens if, if you express uh, uh, Dino in, in, uh, in, in cervical cancer cell lines. Does that basically cause a stabilization of P53? Now, in normal cells, as I mentioned, uh, it's P53 is degraded by MDM2, which is a P53 responsive gene. But in, in, in cervical cancer cell lines, this arm of, of regulation of, of P53 stability is completely inactive. So MDM2. Uh, does not degrade uh, 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 P53 in cervical cancer cell lines. This is completely taken over by E6 and E6AP. This was published many years ago by Martin Schaffner's uh, group in, in Germany. So we, if we did not know, it wasn't completely clear that, that, that overexpressing Dino would actually do something to P53 levels uh, in, in cervical carcinoma cell lines. So we tried to do that for about uh, six months. Sure, tried to basically make cell lines that ectopically express Dino in, in cervical carcinoma lines, and he never got a single cell line out of this stuff. And uh, he was very disappointed, and I was very, I actually kind of liked the data because I thought, well, maybe if we, over, if we highly overexpress Dino in cells, they all die. That's why we can never, you know, never get Dino overexpressing cells. But eventually, we basically decided to make uh, regulated Dino uh, expressing cell lines, basically doxycycline uh, uh, regulated uh, 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 cells, and when you do that, you can you can actually uh, uh, see very nice induction of of uh, Dino in in two cervical carcinoma cell lines, and what happens is basically uh, uh, this basically shows simply that that the amount of induction that you get in the system is very similar to if you induce uh, if you induce p53 in in a uh, if you induce Dino through P53 with a DNA damaging agent. And also, basically, it's the same amount of nucle uh, nucleic, uh, uh, nuclear and cytoplasmic localized uh, P53. So this shows that this ectopic expression system that we have uh, uh, mimics uh, what happens during natural induction of, of Dino. So this is what, what the data shows. So we're not expressing uh, uh, you, uh, enormous amounts of, of uh, Dino, and it goes in the, wrong, in the wrong place in the cell. So what happens if you do that? Well, what happens if you do that is you actually uh, increase uh, P53 levels actually increase, and, and, and impressively also uh, uh, expression of, of a P53 target, uh, P21, also increases. Uh, and uh, this is just the, uh, it happens, this is at the messenger RNA level as this uh, uh, shows that this is another P53 responsive gene called MDM2 that also goes up. Do the same thing with CASCI cells, you see exactly the same thing, P53 going up, P21 going up, and, and it's all uh, through messenger RNA. So this basically shows that you can reconstitute uh, uh, P53 activity in these cells uh, uh, by ectopically expressing Dino. We know that this is through stabilization, as you would expect. Uh, this is a, a cyclohexamide chase experiment, similar to uh, what you did, what you showed us this morning, uh, where you uh, basically just stop uh, translation of, of protein, and, and you can see that the, the half-life is, is increased, as you would expect. 
But is there any biological consequences to that? Well, the cells did not die, which we were kind of disappointed about, but, but we basically now uh, tested uh, the sensitivity of these cells to, to DNA damaging, to chemotherapy. And basically, this is, this is cisplatin, which is, the, which is what is used uh, for therapy of cervical carcinoma. And as you can see, if you basically express DNA in these cells, compared to uh, control uh, SHRNA expressing cells, there's a dramatic, uh, 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 basically, uh, increase in sensitivity to cisplatin. And this is also true for doxorubicin, for mitomycin C, and for 5-FU, which are all sort of DNA damaging agent. So, uh, Ectopic Dino expression in, in, in CIHA cells uh, uh, sort of summarize this uh, uh, basically uh, is if you, if you express Dino, uh, it basically turns on uh, P53. And that, that is exactly what, what, what we saw here, right? So if you express it, we, we can see an increase in P53 within two days, and we see a huge increase in P53 regulative genes. But then for some bizarre reason that I actually never fully understood, uh, 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 but it was very good. Sometimes it's very good if I don't understand uh, why certain experiments are done. Uh, Surey uh, said, well, he, he wanted to know what happens upstream here. My prediction was, well, nothing happens, happens uh, downstream because uh, upstream if you express Dino because it really only functions uh, uh, to regulate P53 levels. But as you might uh, remember from the very beginning of, of, of my talk where I showed you some results with E7 alone, uh, this is maybe why he did this experiment. So what he basically f uh, what he basically showed is that if he uh, uh, if he uh, if he inhibited uh, 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 Jack two and ATM uh, by by using small molecule inhibitors, he basically found uh, if he overexpressed Dino, he basically found that it was a, that that there was a dramatic uh, uh, decrease in in P twenty one in the ability of of Dino to express uh, to induce P twenty one levels. Which is, which is completely not what you predict based on, on, on the simple model. So this was, this was very confusing, uh, uh, and, and this basically shows that this model, uh, at least in, in this particular cell line, it is, this is not correct that Dino basically binds to P53 and thereby stabilizes it. It really is an indirect effect, at least in part. So keeping that in mind, we then did basically Western blot analysis of upstream signaling experiments. So as you can see, if you, now, if you just ectopically express Dino uh, at levels that, that mimic those uh, by, by DNA damage, you can see that you actually induce a DNA damaging pathway. You induce phosphorylation of JAK2, you induce uh, phosphorylation of, of, of ATM, uh, ATM and, and you even uh, can see uh, induction of gamma H2X, the phosphorylated form of of, of H2AX, and we have actually recently shown that we can actually see H2AX dots, etc. So, so we really think that uh, uh, this, this basically shows that, that P53, uh, that Dino can act, maybe it also binds, does it by binding P53, but it, it basically uh, 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 induces uh, DNA damage. So Dino is originally called a, a DNA damage induced non coding RNA, but we think that at least in cerebral cancer cell lines, Dino is a DNA damage inducing non coding RNA. And, and how it does that is, is, is what we're trying to figure out at the moment. So what was known before, before uh, uh, Sure started is, that, uh, is, is this model that was published uh, in, in Nature Genetics. But what he basically shows is that, is that uh, uh, Dino basically functions by inducing DNA damage and, and induces P53 through, uh, through, a, uh, through a very indirect pathway, at least in the cells in the system that, 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 we, are, that we are looking at. So what I've shown you, and I will stop here, is that P53 regulated Dino link RNA expressed low levels in cervical cancer cell lines. We have not been able to uh, stably express Dino in cervical cancer cell lines, and we think this is because high-level expression is, in, is not tolerated by these cells. That acute Dino expression causes P53 stabilization as well as uh, expression of P53 responsive genes, and it induces uh, sensitivity to chemotherapeutics. So that, 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 uh, that, is quite, uh, that, that was quite nice to see. Acute DNA damage, at least in cervical cancer cell lines, we're currently testing whether that's true for any kind of other cell type, activates DNA damaging. So, so, does, so we think that Dino stabilizes P53 as a consequence, at least in part, as a consequence of DNA damage signaling and not as, as an effect of binding P53. 
So, uh, uh, so we, we're quite interested in, in, in understanding whether this is uh, whether, how this actually functions. Is, is it basically through P53? Is this P53? Do we even need P53 in order for uh, for uh, uh, for Dino to do that? We don't think we do, but we don't know at this point of time. So I'm going to stop here and 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 uh, take questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>